Welcome to episode 18 of the Camera Shake podcast with me, Kirsten Nutz and Nick Kirby. The uh, podcast where we talk about everything and anything to do with photography and videography, cameras and anything and everything that's got anything to do with any of that. Episode 18, here we come. So, episode 18, mm -hmm. here we are. How are things? Things are okay. Um, got a little bit of sleep last night for the first time in a week, which is fantastic. <laughs> okay. I've been living on about two hours sleep, if that. Cool. So, yeah, pretty exhausted. But last night was all right. Well, that's thank, good. Thank God, given that we're recording today. Yeah. Did you go for a sleep mask type of a deal? No, no. I just dealt with it. Yeah. And, you know, I think my brain's extra active the last uh, last last week or, week or so. So, yeah. Uh, I think I've just got so tired, my brain decided, right, you have to sleep. So yeah. I did. Do you think that's? Do you think that's because we're kind of, you know, going kind of, sort of back to normal? Or it is a bit of a change. Is things do feel ever so slightly different, right? Mm. You know, I appreciate it's very little change and it's very gradual, but it's definitely a marked difference. Because you know, we've been mm. out and about doing a couple of bits and pieces yeah. lately, and um, you know all the zoom calls that everybody's been having every single day have mm. you know gradually decreased i think and mm. you know a little more in person stuff happening so it's a, yeah. another change and i do recall having sleeping issues when uh, lockdown first started as well yeah true you know, yeah so same it could well be to do with that and the weather's changing again so yeah well i mean i've been waking up really early and the the, the problem is um i i really am really bad at going to sleep when it's too bright like, you know, when you have like yeah. sun coming into the room or whatever. Totally. Um, so I bought myself a sleep mask a couple of months ago. Um, this is different to a uh, cleansing facial mask. Very different, yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. It's different to a gel mask. Although although this sleep mask has like sort of gel, jelly kind of inlays sort of thing. So you can actually open your eyes inside of the mask mm -hmm. and obviously not see anything. But it's not, you know, you're not hindered by the actual material. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's not bad. It's very comfortable. It's very fluffy and soft. Highly recommend it. <laughs> Fluffy and soft. <laughs> Which is great. You sold it to me. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it doesn't really feel like you've got anything on your face. That's what uh -huh. I'm saying. It's, um, it is remarkably good. And it does add a good two hours to my sleep. Because usually what happens is, like, when it's bright inside of the room and I wake up and let's say it's 4.30 in the morning or something, I'm up. That is it. Mm. You know, I'm done. I'm not going to go back to sleep. So um, so this sort of, it works. It looks slightly ridiculous. I'm quite sure it does. But then you're wearing a mask. You can't really see it. So it's like, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely helped the sleep deprivation thing. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I've been going for a cycle. I go through cycles of it and they can last for years, unfortunately. Yeah. But I do go through cycles. And it's not necessarily the waking up early. It's more getting, I can get to sleep, but then I'll wake up at, you know, silly o'clock in the morning, you know, like yeah. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., something like that. 4 a.m. is a cr crucial one. That seems to be the constant in my life. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll be awake. That's it. I see the going to sleep thing. Um, it's not really a problem for me. Um, I can, like my wife can attest to that. I can go to sleep at a drop of her head. Mm -hmm. Like literally you put TV on, you know, hunker down on the couch and I'm gone in five minutes. No problemo. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> you know, put some of uh, I don't know the expanse on. <laughs> you know, so um, I used to do this uh, this thing. I used to have to do this thing where you like, you know, I'd, I'd watch a movie at night or like in the evening, and I'd literally watch it in like fifteen minute increments. Like I'd see, I'd watch fifteen minutes, I fall asleep. Like the next day, I have to go back and I like, okay, I'm gonna watch it from from here another yeah, fifteen minutes. Yeah. So it's like it takes like a week to get through a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. But at the moment, we're watching The Expanse. Any good? Uh, yeah, man. It's good. It is really good. Is that, um, what's that on? Netflix? Amazon? You know, it's a good question. I think it's on Prime. Okay. Yeah, I forget. We've got so many of these. Services. I don't recognize it on Netflix. So yeah, probably it's Prime. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it is on Prime. Um, yeah, we're a bit late to the party there. But um, we just recently you know, got aware of it. Mm. Um, it's good. Yes, yeah, sci-fi drama you know I, I married the right woman because she loves spaceships perfect no problem they're a rare breed hey man aliens and spaceships sold <laughs> winner it's like let's have a typical uh 
typical conversation at home. It's like, hey, do you want to watch this movie? There's are spaceships in it. Yeah, done. Nice. <laughs> so nice. it's just good. Um, but yeah, it's good. The expense is good, man. It's like, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's in the future, but it's not too far in the future. So it's like, it's all about space travel within our solar system. Okay. So, you know, humankind hasn't gotten to the point yet where they can do interstellar travel, but they can quite easily travel from like Earth to Moon or, or to the moons of Saturn or something like that, you know, or, or other planets within the solar system. Um, and so, so, so human, humankind have, or humans have to split up into three groups. Like you've got the Earthers who are living on Earth and basically ruin the environment and all the rest of it. And then you've got the Martians who are those who have colonized Mars. Mm -hmm. And they obviously, they grow up in, in lower gravity, in a lower gravity environment and everything. And then you've got the Belters who are those who basically live um, on, like, on, on certain moons or asteroids or something where they're mining those for metals and resources and stuff. And uh, it's really interesting the way I've done it. It's, um, it's quite, once you get into it, you know, it takes a little while, like like a lot of uh, TV shows, you know, season ones, it takes a little while to get going. But once you get into it, it's like, oh, okay, okay, cool. Um, and it's, it's cool the way they've done it. Um, the CGI is really good for a TV show. That's always, that amazes me. Like, you know, not too long ago, you would want to see this in movies. Right. Do you know what I mean? And now yeah. it's like, now they, they do these kind of advanced CGI things in TV shows. Mm -hmm. And you're going to go, wow, okay. Yeah, that's um, yeah. you know I've seen fairly recent movies where the CGI wasn't as good as in it. Yeah, do you know? What I mean? Absolutely. So you know, and the same thing because it, it kind of makes everything looks much. It, it makes things look much bigger because they can expand, yeah, extend sets and you know. Um. So uh, yeah, it's good. That's cool. It's been good. It sounds like something I'd enjoy. Yeah, man. i I've you know it's one of these shows where I've seen the thumbnails around for a couple of years and never really gotten into it. Mm. Um. And mostly, I think, because you see these kind of shows, you know, on on uh, Netflix or on on Prime, you see the thumbnail. And sometimes, if they, depending on what the thumbnail looks like, you might sort of get the impression as if it's like it's kind of like a B movie type of a thing, you know. Right. Or, yeah, I'm not yeah. necessarily yeah. interested, especially if it's on Prime. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is with Prime. So all, all they have is B and C list movies. It's uh, it's got better recently. See the thing that I don't I don't get about Prime is the whole search functionality. Uh, like, yeah. I don't understand. Like, as a Prime member, you get you can watch X amount of movies and whatever for free, but then there are also other movies that you have to rent or pay for or buy, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. But there's no there doesn't seem to be any way that that you can only look at the movies that so you on get the free. on the app on your phone or TV I'm not sure but mm. I was looking at this on the desktop um version if you like mm. um not a few days ago and you can filter to films which are free for me Oh really okay is all prime or whatever they call it it's something like yeah. that you can do that now Okay well definitely on the desktop I don't know about the others Yeah um now I'm going to I'm going to check that on the on the old Apple TV box Yeah yeah you know um it's one of these things because you end up with so many like different services. Like we get Netflix, and we get we get Prime, and we get Disney Plus. You know, um, mainly because of Star Wars on it, and the kids. You know, yeah, you, yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's a secondary consideration. It's like, shall we get Disney Plus? Um, Star Wars, yeah, sure, it's yeah, all done. done. That's it. Although um, the whole Marvel movie marathon thing during lockdown, that's where that came in handy because mm. it's it, you know it's got pretty much all the Marvel movies on it. That's cool. Um, so yeah, so the expense very good. Okay, I'll check it out. Um, what have I been watching? I've been oh, uh, last few days I've been watching the Mo uh, Money Heist is what it's called on oh, okay. Netflix, and it, it looks like it's been around for a few years, but I don't recall ever seeing it on Netflix before. So I don't know whether they just acquired it or it's just been yeah. hard to find or mm. whatever it is. Um, but it's a Spanish series, and they dubbed it in English. They've dubbed it pretty well. And the basic plot is is probably what you'd anticipate. It's a it's like a bank robbery. But what they do yeah. is they there's a group of them get together with a top notch kind of plan, if you like, to go into the Royal Mint in um, Madrid, mm -hmm. and they 
print money. They okay. Steal money. They print their own money. Oh, cool. Okay. That's so it's, yeah. it's slight slight twist on the typical idea, if you like. Okay, and okay. the whole first series is about them doing that. Uh, I just crossed into the second series. They're just coming to the end of it in just a few episodes in, so I mm. can't even imagine where it's going to go from here. Um, mm. But there's four series and there's a fifth one coming too. Yeah, really? Okay. Which is really cool. Um, yeah, so I don't typically watch dubbed um, TV or, or films. If I watch mm. films, they're always subtitled yeah. um, if, they're, if they're non uh, non-English. Um, so this is, this is quite a first for me. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Great series. Highly recommend it, by yeah. the way. Cool. Well, it might, might be the next the next show on the list then. Because mm-hmm. um, we're coming up to the end of season three, I think, of, uh, of The Expense. I think it's four. So, okay. you know, we're getting there. It's always, I'm always getting worried when, when, you know, when I realize we're about halfway through. And it's like, okay, now I'm going to start thinking about what to watch next. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. So, so yeah. Um, well, I see the thing about dub movies is I grew up with dub movies. Um, you know, because growing up in the in the south of Germany, um, everything's dubbed in Germany, like everything. So uh, this really, there's a very low acceptance for uh, subtitles mm-hmm. generally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'm sure that there's some people who like to watch movies with the ori- in the original version and, and read the subtitles. I'm sure that, but um, but generally speaking, everything's dubbed. So you know, when you grow up with it, it's, it becomes normal. Um, and that's it, right? And I think that's what it's all about is. We didn't get dubbed in the UK. We ne- almost, well, never, because yeah. there's very little that we'd import that wasn't from America or that we created in the UK ourselves, right? Because yeah. they've been the two main countries for programming and and movies for, sure. for forever, yeah, right? Exactly. So there's very little that would come in. And because it was so little, there's no no call for, for dubbing. So yeah. it was always just, I guess that's why subtitles came in as the... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, the, one of the major movie industries... Well, I mean, the United States and and the UK are two of the, the major movie production, co- you know, countries in mm-hmm. the world, really. So, um, you know, and English is so wide, widely spoken that there's really no need to, yeah, for the most part, to dub anything really. But um, uh, I mean, Germany. If you think about how many German speakers there are in the in the world compared to English speakers, you know, it's yeah. it's um, it's an absolute minority. So, um, but again, they're very good at at doing it you know this is the thing that like it's not like the you know the kind of kung fu dubbing thing where you can see mouths moving when there's no words coming out you know it's not it's not like that at all they're very 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 good at doing it but there's always stuff that you that you miss and and i think for me i only really realized that when uh, you know when i moved to an english-speaking country uh, or when i started watching movies in the original version Mm. um and that's you know the one thing that you miss when you watch something that's been dubbed is you you can see or you watch an actor's visual performance right but you don't because you've got a different voice actor providing the voice you're not really gonna get an impression as to how good the original actor actually is like if you take somebody like robert de niro for example or you know um you kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, because he's always dubbed and he has this dubbed voice. I mean, he always speaks in accent free German, of course, when he's being dubbed, you know. So you don't really realize that he actually has quite a strong Austrian yes, he does. accent when he speaks English. You know, it's just a dimension that you're missing. Get to the chopper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the whole I'll be back joke is completely lost in the German version. Oh, what a shame. Because he'll just say, I'll be back, like in German, you know, mm. but so, so there's, there's sort of a whole, um, yeah, there's a whole dimension that, you, that you're missing. Um, and, you know, it kind of, yeah, it, it makes you appreciate certain mm. actors more, Definitely. I think. Um, yeah, it's one of these things. Um, yeah. So have you done any photography this, this week? Um, little, actually. It's been a, it's been a quiet week, if I'm brutally honest. Mm. And that's mostly because I've been too exhausted. I mean, so tired of what you are. I could. No, I need to. I need to. <laughs> Plus, actually, I hurt my ankle, so um, I've been kind of laying in bed, icing that yeah. up a little bit too. So that hasn't helped. Well, see, but when you did 
heard you echo. You actually heard it during a Ferrari shoot. Well, I did, so, yes. So I heard it <laughs> doing yeah. photography, yeah. which is, uh, well, there you go. This is the irony of it. Um, yeah, so we, uh, when was it, started last week? Uh, start, well, several days ago now. We um, filmed and photographed a whole bunch of Ferraris going around a, a track um, near near Birmingham, was it? Yeah, it was. Birmingham, wasn't it? Yeah, it was near, um, was it near Tamworth? Yeah, somewhere like that. Somewhere like that. It was a racetrack. Somewhere like that. Yeah, which was cool, good fun. Nice to see some of those cars going around. Yeah, it was good. I mean, you know what was good was, in a sense, you know, it was an event, but it wasn't a public event. It yeah. was drivers only. There was no, uh, there were no spectators or anything. Um, and, and well, drivers and us essentially. And um, so I almost got like a little sense of normality uh, when we were there because, um, you know, it was an event like a, it, it wasn't like a public event. It was drivers only. There was no no spectators or anything. It was basically drivers and us. Um, but still, it kind of felt like, you know, a day out. Hmm. And, um, and it just, yeah, it just felt it was a nice day as well. So mm. that kind of helped. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was just an interesting thing to do. I think it's probably the first really fun event sort of thing that I've been to since March. Yeah, since that the sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also, you know, well, I mean, it was fun photographing these cars, uh, but we got to ride in them as well. So that was even better. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, we did. Yeah. Which was incredible. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Love that. I like going around tracks and yeah. cars like that. What was your favorite sort of aspect of um of of going around a track? Um I'd, I'd, have you done that before? You've been around no, a track no, in, a, in a like a supercar. Uh, no, I actually haven't. No, I don't think so that. I've I've driven a couple around the track before like right. years ago now, and actually I'm due to go again with a uh, um with with one of my best mates in mm. the next few months. We had to delay it because of covid yeah. and all of that as you can imagine um so i have done it before it's a very different experience driving um right. but to go around as a passenger i mean it's it's like you you want it to go faster all the time yeah. and it's, it's funny because if i'm in a car going fast i feel safe right and i feel like uh, I, I, I could go i could go faster and i'd be still quite happy but i hate theme parks oh really I can't do it. Oh, really? I hate wow. it. Okay. They. It's not that I'm. I'm, I'm scared or terrified of oh, any of the gonna rides. To, we're going to go to Thor Park together. It's not happening. Oh my god! It's not really happening. So much fun, it man. won't happen. I can't do it. <laughs> Wicked. Take me two hundred mile an hour in a car. Yeah. All right. Right. I can deal with that. I, feel, I just feel safe doing that. Yeah. Rightly or wrongly, but that's how I feel. Yeah. Uh, it's a weird. I'm. I'm weird. I've got a very strange yeah. brain. Oh. Okay. Well, you know, we used to have a season ticket, like a family season uh, ticket thing for Thor Park. Mm. Like for those mm-hmm. of you who don't know, Thor Park is um, is a, a theme park in the south of England. South of England? Is this south of England? This yeah. is south of England. Right, it's Staines. Yeah, it's not far from here, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and it is pretty awesome. Have you, have you been to Thor Park before? Many, many, many years yeah. ago. There's some really cool rides. Um, some of them maybe. I didn't get on many. Oh, did you? Oh, no. Oh, um, there's some awesome rides. Yeah. Do you want to know the last time I did go on any kind of ride? What was that? And felt like throwing up is, well, you know Legoland. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can imagine, right. So I went there with my, <laughs> with my, uh, my, my young niece yeah. and, um, and we went around all the usual kind of bits that you, you expect in Legoland. Yeah. And she wanted to go on a ride. I thought, okay, no worries. I can yeah. handle this. And it, what it was, was a, I think it was supposed to be a pirate ship that would swing back and forth oh, yeah, like yeah. that okay mm. and it, it it goes all the way 90 degrees I mean, and we were sat right on the back row yeah uh, and you know it was people and people facing each other as well yeah so we sat there and i i had my gopro with me at the time because i thought we'd make a little video of the day and i didn't want to take a camera so i'll take this round just yeah. uh, uh so, all right okay i'm gonna film us while we're while we're while we're on this and it started going it was okay at first and it kept going okay home Oh, I can feel my stomach going a little bit, and it started getting up. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sick. I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna throw off everywhere. This is not good. So <laughs> oh, I, I had to stop filming, carefully put it in my pocket, and just hold on yeah. <laughs> and not let my knees see. Oh no, <laughs> I felt so awful, so awful. Um, I don't think I've ever really felt sick on a ride. That's a Legoland ride, man. Well, that's hardcore, of mm-hmm. course, you know. Um, baby, right here. The cool thing about Legoland is they've got this whole uh, section 
uh, this whole Star Wars section. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, St- uh, Star Wars Lego. Yeah. And the models yeah. are incredible. It's great. That's yeah. really awesome. Um, because they they sort of re they, they've kind of constructed scenes from the movies in Lego, mm-hmm. like this one uh, where the Millennium Falcon lifts off. That's right. Yeah. Stuff like that. So it's it is very cool. Um, but yeah, we you know, like I said, we had this uh, season ticket last year for Thor Park, and so we went. I don't know every every few weeks we went. Um, because once you have a, although the season tickets in themselves are pricey, it's one of these ridiculous pricing structures where like, you know, uh, let's say like a, a one day ticket is like 60 quid or something, mm. but then the season ticket is 65. Yeah. It makes no sense. So, you know, when, when you buy them for the whole family, initially it's really quite, it's ex- it seems expensive, but then you make the money back on the second visit. Yeah. So, you know, if you're looking for, I mean, as a family, if you're looking for things for something to do that becomes so you know it becomes less expensive the more often you do it um actually this is not a bad you know thought park is not a bad it, or theme park is not a bad thing from a business perspective it's genius really of course if you because it to have one person in there it it doesn't cost them anything to have someone going on a ride necessarily yeah, yeah, sure. other than maintenance costs which they're gonna do anyway yeah no matter how many people have it, they're going to do it regardless. It's yeah. not number of rides necessarily. It'll be every week or... And, and once you're there, you know, you buy food and drinks exactly. and whatever else. And, yeah. So if it, if it encourages people to spend just an extra fiver on a ticket, mm. which people won't would, would do and do do, obviously, yeah. it means they will definitely come back again at least once. Oh, for sure. Whereas before, if they just bought the single ticket, they might not come back again. No, it's exactly. It's so smart yeah. and so simple. And it's, you know, we, we are cheapskates. <laughs> because basically we take our own lunches and stuff <laughs> you know but um but then you know we're a family of five if you think about it yeah. you know it's like a lot it's of a fortune yeah it is it could this could be a really expensive day out um but the way we do it is you know it doesn't really cost us that much mm. um i think you, you also get a discount on the parking i think something like that so it's not really not really that bad and um it is fun i got on a good day it's fun um and of course when you have a season ticket you don't necessarily have to spend all day there you know, it could be an afternoon, for yeah, example. Yeah. You know, it's about a I don't know, it's about a twenty minute car ride from, from where we live. So yeah. it's easy. Yeah. There's one there's one ride though. Let me tell you about this ride. It's called Stealth. Um it's my favorite ride there. Um because it's totally over the top. It's like totally over the top. Essentially the whole thing is like, I don't know, eleven seconds long, the whole ride. Like you queue for two hours to get into this eleven second ride. <laughs> Right, make it fifteen seconds, whatever it is. Um, that doesn't feel like enough of a return for me. Oh my god! <laughs> the first time I went on this ride, and I go into those rides with my stepdaughter. So what happens is my stepson and my youngest, like my oldest and my youngest, they're both they go on the kind of on the kitty rides mm-hmm. because my youngest isn't old enough to go on some of the bigger rides yet, and my stepson doesn't like any of the scary rides, so he's he's quite happy going on the mm-hmm. smaller rides with her. Um, my wife only does teacups. That's all she does, right? She's not like into the whole... That's that's where I'd be. Right thing, you know. <laughs> and um, and my stepdaughter is a thrill seeker, right? So, and then, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going on the big rides, no problem. You know, Not necessarily a thrill seeker, I would say, but I'm happy to do it. Um, and so we, what happens is normally, you know, her and me will end up queuing for those bigger rides. And then um, my stepson and my daughter go, the youngest one, they go off. Mm-hmm. And do the, the little rides, and uh, and so we went onto onto this thing called stealth. And what happens is, this thing basically accelerates, like from zero to seventy miles an hour or something in like I don't know a second or something. It's the most oh. insane acceleration that you've ever experienced, or that I've anyway ever experienced. Um, and it shoots forward; it accelerates like crazy and then it almost goes vertically up like i don't know 50 meters up or something like that and then you get to the top and then it literally drops vertically down back the way you came or no just it just goes over the hump essentially and then it just drops vertically down and then it rolls out so it seems like you know there are no loops see my heart's racing already just hearing about it (laughs) um so the first time i did this ride i remember the acceleration was so insane. And then the jolt from going, you know, horizontal to going vertically up 
was so insane that it completely screwed with all of my senses. It was like somebody like freeze dried my brain. It was like, you just couldn't take it in. There's like too much happening too fast. Like the brain was completely overpowered. And before you knew it, you came to the end and you're like, what the heck has mm-hmm. just happened? Mm-hmm. You know? And then the more often you go on it, you, you kind of know what to expect. So, you know, it, you take it, you take it in more, but it is so extreme. So much fun though. It's, it's also very addictive once you've done it once and you've gotten over the fear factor. Is strangely addictive, and um, and so all of a sudden, you know, queuing for a couple of hours to go on a like twelve second ride or something seems like a good idea for some reason. Mm. What is good though is um, this is one of the advantages when you have a season ticket is of course you can go on all the off days like the rainy days and all that kind of stuff, and of course when you go on the days where it looks like rain or it just fizzles a little bit or whatever, then there's going to be a lot fewer people there. Yeah, and so you get on the rides more often. Like this, virtually no waiting time or no queuing time. Uh, and that's really fun. I mean, then you really get your money's worth because you're literally just walking through, you get on the rides, you're walking through. And then you get the opportunity also to get like in the front car in some of those rides. So we did stealth in the front car. Man, <laughs> that's awesome. Yep. And it, with a lot of those rides, I'm never going to a theme park with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, but with a lot of those rides, like being in the front car is actually, it's sort of an enhanced experience yeah, of bet. the general ride. Um, so another cool little theme park story there. Um, so where my mom lives in the south of Germany, um, she lives relatively close to a theme park um, where they have, I think, is it Europe's biggest or the world's biggest wooden um, roller coaster? And so the whole thing's constructed of wood, right? Which kind of a little bit scary maybe the first time mm. because everything creaks and it's mm. like you know. Um, but but it, nevertheless, it's actually a cool roller coaster. It's more like a classic roller coaster, and it's you know it's tall and huge and everything else. Um, and it's you know it's really good fun. But we went there. Um, I think it was Halloween. What happens is they uh, they open the rides at nighttime, and you do like a midnight kind of run on the roller coaster. Okay. And uh, and my youngest was just old enough to be allowed on this wooden roller coaster, and we had a completely clear night. All the stars, especially in the south of Germany, you see a lot of stars. Mm, and it was the most beautiful night sky. And you're on there at like midnight and you go up and you're on a roller coaster, on a roller coaster under a starry sky. Wicked. I'm surprised you didn't take your camera on. It was cold as heck. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I didn't... Did I have... Um, I think I filmed something on my phone at the time. But it was just like... It was... It was a really cool experience, actually, because mm. mm. you never really go on a roller coaster at nighttime. No. Anyway, you know, so. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite cool. That's a good one. Yeah. So we're like a theme park family almost, a little bit. <laughs> you know, thrill-seeking right there. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Anyway, coming back to the Ferrari thing. Yeah. You know what struck me the most? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I love going around the track and everything. Um, that was definitely an experience. And actually just kind of, you know, Taking in the smells and the, the the engine sounds and everything was very cool, and then also just appreciating the way these cars are built. You know, uh, I found it really, uh, really fascinating. The one thing that fascinated me the most, though, is when you're on the starting line, you're waiting to go on the track, and the engine is on. You know, it's running, mm-hmm. and you're sitting there. I never realized how hot it gets in the cockpit. Did didn't it? Like right. it gets roasting, and then. Well, I noticed like as soon as you put on, you know, as soon as, soon as you put on your foot and you, you accelerate, all of that hot air gets blown out when you put the windows open. Yeah. That was a really cool experience because it like heats up and boom. Yeah, boom, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. 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 Um, so, so yeah, that's really quite, the whole thing's quite enjoyable. What I did, and this is what, what was different from the prior couple of supercars I've been in before, mm. was the, its cornering was just unreal. I mean, I've never felt a car be able to stick to the ground. Oh yeah, at going those kind of speeds around the corner. Yeah, you know, and it felt like it was a slower speed. When you look at the dial, it, ooh, wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. but um, but the car that we were in, um, he uh, burnt out his clutch, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> should have got hybrid. Hey, Gary. Yeah, it's the yeah. future. <laughs> it's, it's looking good when we rolled up in our hybrid. 
going all electric onto the <laughs> onto the circuit. Well, but um, yeah, yeah, it was good fun. It was a great day. Photos are you know photos look good as well. It, you know, from talking photography here for a second, really for no. a change. No. Um, so I mean, shooting this whole event uh, was cool because it gave us an opportunity. Or, you know, it, it gave me an opportunity anyway to um to practice panning shots. It's hard, right? It's a difficult technique to do. But you only get good at it by repeating. Oh, we're rinse and repeat, yeah. rinse, rinse, rinse and repeat. But it's just like it's one of these things where you really need to um, hone down. It's a fine line between shutter speed and you know getting getting it to look right. Um, and, and it's estimating how fast that car is going versus the shutter speed that you're going to want for the correct. speed of that car. It's very correct. very difficult. See, and this is the thing. Um, so when you're doing a panning shot on, so a panning shot for for those people who don't know is essentially when. Um, you follow whatever it is that you photograph and say car. When a car goes by, you follow the car. You press the shutter button and you follow the car. And so the idea is basically that you get the car itself sharp in the image and you want to see the movement on the background. So it looks like that car mm-hmm. moves through a space that's kind of blurred out. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, and of course you could do that like with a cyclist, for example, and I know um, a friend of mine went to Amsterdam, I think, to shoot um, cyclists for this specific reason, just to do panning shots of cyclists. And of course, you know, there's no better place to go than than Amsterdam or any, any place in Holland, for that matter. Um, and of course, cyclists move a lot slower yeah. than race cars. Yeah. So you really have to fine tune your shutter speed to get that right. Um, and that was what I found was was the hardest because if you if you set your shutter speed too high, you get a sharp car, but your background isn't quite as blurred yeah. as you'd want it to be. And also the other thing, and this is what I noticed in particularly in editing afterwards, is that you get a certain look to the wheels. Mm-hmm. You know, so the tires or the wheels look a certain way and they look different depending on whether you're using like I don't know, 125, you know, um, 120 fifth per second or, or whether you're using like 320 or whatever it is mm-hmm. per second. So, Getting the right, getting the wheels to look right, and getting the the background to uh, to kind of blur out to just the right degree, and keeping the car sharp, that's quite tricky. Yeah, you know, I think you end up with a. It, it depends what event you're at. Well, I mean, the, what mm. we were at, everyone was going around at different speeds depending on who was driving because they're all yeah. you know am- amateur drivers who have got. Who happen to have these these cars? They're all doing mm. very different speeds. Yeah. Whereas, I guess if you're at a pro event, they're going to be coming through at very similar yeah. speeds. So, I'm guessing what you you're you're going to have your ballpark as to where you know you're going to want to start. Yeah. And once you've done a few test shots, I guess you'll find what's going to work in the position you're at yeah. for the speed that those cars are going in through that mm. that chicane or wherever they might be. Um, but that that was hard. That was hard. And panning is very very difficult. But talk about cyclists. But you're I can imagine I've not done it with a cyclist mm. previously, and they do go slow. So, I mean, what, what are we going to do to our, our shutter speed there? Well, we're going to have to we're going to have to lower it. Yeah, you know that's exactly. the thing. Um, I've seen some amazing. You start then introducing potential actual camera shake into that, depending on how low you go. Mm. So it becomes even harder. So I guess you know once you start hitting you know below a hundred, you know yeah. maybe you're eighty or, or sixty, or whatever, whatever it might be. Then you're 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 introducing camera shake massively, and you're well, going to have to stick it on a tripod. Yeah, and I think I think the, the biggest problem there is that you know you got to really keep your movement, your camera movement as smooth as possible because yeah. the because the object that you're like your main subject that you're focusing on is actually moving through the frame. So you know to get that sharp, you have to be a hundred percent moving with. Yeah, with the object, with the subject, so um, so that's where you kind of your, your panning technique comes in. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen some amazing shots of cyclists actually, mm. um, where you know the cyclist was tack sharp and there was a lot of blur in the background. So um, that's yeah, it's it's tricky. So my my experience on the track day was that it was easier to keep the car in focus and keep it sharp when it was at like three twenty shutter yep. speed, let's say. But the background didn't look as good as it did at like you know one twenty fifth, for example. But I found it much harder to keep the car a hundred percent in focus. Yeah, at at one twenty five. So um, you know, 
it was an interesting it was an interesting experience and just kind of getting an idea as to what the parameters were do you know what i mean mm. um and now now it's just a matter of practice how did so, you yeah. balance that with your aperture so what what aperture did you end up going with? So obviously, lower aperture, the more depth, uh, less depth of field you're going to have, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a fine balance as well because it also depends how far away you are and all that kind of stuff. So, did you play around with your aperture as well as your shutter speed that day? Yeah, I did, I did a, a number of things. Um, so my first assumption was that um, that the aperture wasn't going to have that much of an impact, seeing that I wanted. The, seeing that the the background would be kind of blurred out by movement mm -hmm. rather than what you would do in a portrait situation, sure. yeah, yeah, um, where where you you know where you use depth of field. So I figured that depth of field wasn't probably going to be that much of an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of figured if I go for an aperture like say f eight, which is pretty much I think what I started with, um, then I would have a higher chance of keeping the car in focus. Absolutely. So that was my thinking initially. Um, so tried that. That worked quite well. Um, I did also try um, some kind of wider apertures, like 5.6, stuff like that. Uh, because the day was kind of, it was a really nice day, but sometimes it was very sunny and there were some clouds and it was a little mm -hmm. bit overcast sometimes. So the light kept changing. Um, and so I I had to um, adjust the, the aperture quite a lot just simply to make up for the change in, in, uh, in daylight mm -hmm. or in sunlight. And so what I did in the end was um, I switch to um shutter speed priority okay where i essentially just determined the shutter speed and i set like a, i set a limit on the iso and then i just let the camera determine the aperture and it also worked so you know in terms of and that you know in a, in a, in a way that made it easier to uh, adjust for the changing lighting conditions mm -hmm. so i think had it been the kind of day where it's either totally overcast and light doesn't change or you know be totally sunny or whatever but if the light was constant it would have been easier um, to go like, okay, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set my um, aperture to this, and I'm gonna try it at three point two or whatever, yeah, uh, with an ND filter, la la, you know. Um, but as it was on that particular day, it just kept changing all the time, yeah. And so it was a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, and so in the beginning, you know, I kind of realized, oh, you know, I'm constantly like underexposing or overexposing. Um, so uh, eventually, yeah, shutter speed priority did actually do the trick on that. Okay, that's cool. Well. Um, that's cool. Yeah. So, um, so from a, purely from a technical perspective, uh, it was quite an interesting shoot. And the strike rate, like the hit rate, in the end was was quite high actually. That's good. Yeah, surprisingly, I kind of thought I wasn't really sure what I was going to get because it's really difficult to determine it on the back of the camera. I don't. It's, you know, something looks great on the screen on the back of the camera. It's and not, then when get you get it back, it's out of focus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's not 100% sharp. Or, yeah. It's just, you know, so I find it very difficult to kind of get an idea as to what yeah. what the actual hit rate is. Um, but when I went through the images later in, in Lightroom, they're actually quite a lot of keepers. So, you know, and of course, sometimes because you shoot in burst mode, that's the other thing. So I had it to the like highest burst mode um, on my camera. Um, so you just fire as you go as the car passes by um you know you have images where you know you're missing the back of the car or the front of the car mm -hmm. or yeah um or it's not 100 percent level or whatever it is um, and then there are other images in that brush where you go oh that's perfect you know and also i mean the focus then changes as well because although you track the object with or you attract the car with with autofocus in like autofocus tracking mode or whatever right. it's called it doesn't really track fast enough to make sure that all of those images are 100% in focus. So that's the other thing. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's kind of, it's a balancing act. Mm. But yeah, we've got some good photos of that. Yeah, that's cool, man. So I took a, a load of video that day as well mm. with the intent of having a short sort of little clip of, mm. you know, of our, our, our day and, and so on. Uh, the change in lighting conditions was a nightmare. I couldn't stand it. So I ended up, um, I needed an ND filter, a very ND filter on the entire day. Um, yeah. Because awesome. I wanted the ISO as low as I could. And I, I wanted to shoot the shallowest depth of field that I I, I could do on, yeah. I can do on the GH5 or on these particular lenses, I should say, sorry, which is um, 2.8 on yeah. those. 
which is equivalent to 5.6 full frame. Oh, really? Okay. Um, so it's still high, but that's welcome to micro full thirds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but that was fun. The, the challenging thing is it was a very small track that was on, and there's only so many places we could go. So there's only so much footage you can get from one place without it looking exactly the same yeah. all the time. Um, so um, I'm undecided right now as to how I'm going to edit it, but we got a load of close-up footage of the cars as well, mm -hmm. some you know, detailed kind of B-roll. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering whether we intersperse that with um, perhaps some talking about the type of photos that we want to do with cars in the future and mm. things like that could be really interesting, but we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's overall really, uh, really interesting day. Um, there were so many different Ferraris there as well. Mm, some know. very old, some yeah. much newer. Yeah, Magnum PI was there. Magnum PI in was yellow. There. Yeah, in yellow. Yeah. <laughs> so, if anybody asks, if anybody asks, like, what these cars are actually called, it's all I can tell you. It's uh, you know, it was red. It had a stripe on it, and the other one was yellow. Yeah, that was a brown one too. Or is it red? Well, no, it was a dark red, maroon kind of color. Yeah, maroon, it? bronzy kind mm. of. Yeah, you know. yeah. That was yeah. a. That must have been like a nineteen seventies. It was a blue or, one. Is that right? Oh yeah, that was a blue one. It was like a Formula four car or whatever it is there Ooh, too you know what there was a was it a, there was a jaguar there wasn't there the oh there thing. was a there was a hybrid jag was so it hybrid see the thing about the jag was like was it fully electric it was like a jaguar type. it's almost like a little muscly car and under normal circumstances anywhere else you would have looked at that jag and you would have gone yeah it's a pretty fast car it's an awesome car you know great surrounded by lots of ferraris that looked like you know like the ugly kid, yeah, <laughs> I mean, and he he was going around in electrics. You you heard it going around. So it it may as well not have been driving. Yeah, ridiculous. It's the future. It's the future. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Well, they were lucky that we didn't take the uh, RAF hybrid on there because oh, yeah. you know, it would have burned everyone. Yeah, put everyone to shame. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm. I wonder. You know, I wonder in terms of uh, in terms of acceleration, if you match those Ferraris, some of those. You know, especially the the one with the stripe, whatever that was. The pista. The pista. If you match that with a Tesla, I wonder which car would have the uh, the fast acceleration. I don't know if anybody anybody watching this or listening to this can uh, can tell us um, which one the faster car will be. That'd be great. No idea. I know which one I'd have more fun in. Oh yeah. Well yeah. It would not be a Tesla. <laughs> Well, I've never driven it. You don't mind talking about a Tesla. You don't mind my dog has got his first acting job. <laughs> yes, you've heard it here. I don't first. think you mentioned the uh, the dog last episode, so you can mention him twice. <laughs> so, um, so my dog has an acting job in a YouTube video. That's uh, it's all about testing. Apparently, the Tesla has some dog function like a dog recognition function i'm guessing i don't know really but i'm guessing it's basically just detecting whether there's an animal in the car or not um but anyway this this feature will be tested and in order to test this one needs a dog this is where my dog comes in the very jumpy well bitey very excitable dog well if it can't detect that dog it's useless. then it's yeah. useless <laughs> <laughs> you know because i mean he's gonna go crazy in there but uh but yeah so that'd be fun that's cool very, very cool. Yeah. Look forward to seeing that. I know. I'll be a dog agent. Yes. <laughs> He'll be a YouTube star. Okay. What's your commission? Well, it's a good question. 30%. 30% oh, <laughs> of? <laughs> well, nothing. Ah, no. <laughs> yeah. So those, those were the, um, were the, the photography events. Uh, I went and did another laboratory shoot. Oh, cool. So I shot another lab. How was that? Um... I guess they don't change too much from the shoot to shoot. Um, no, I guess not. I mean, it's um, I don't know. There is something about these kind of industrial buildings when they're empty, especially. Mm. Um, this one had um some equipment in there because I think they were just in the process of moving some of the stuff in. Um, so it's kind of it's interesting to see this sort of you know um, machinery and mm. stuff. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that they're going to be using um you know as than that it's a bit like school labs just for grown-ups <laughs> you know um got the bunsen burners out have they pretty, pretty much <laughs> yeah no i mean it's you know it's one of these 
bread and butter kind of shoots. Yeah, so, um, yeah for sure. But you know, it gets you out of the house. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's just sort of um, driven home how things are very slowly going back to not necessarily normal, but you know, mm-hmm. to like where, where things are happening. So, you know, because a few few shoots have happened, this you know, a couple more lined up and stuff like that. So, and things are, you know, there's conversations that are taking place with uh, potential future clients and all that kind of stuff. So it's exactly. slowly moving in the right direction. Well, let's see what happens. Now, this, my dear viewers and listeners, will be a first on the Camera Shake podcast. Let me introduce you to our guests for today's show. The American Heart ah. and the Farmhouse. Dinner. <laughs> so, interesting camera stories. Um, not camera story as such, but I did a little bit of exporting testing. Oh, okay. On uh, Premiere Pro this week. All right. Nothing scientific by any stretch, but... Um, did you wear a lab coat? Yeah, I did. Oh. Yeah, I did. That's all. <laughs> nothing else. Just a lab <laughs> yeah, coat. Yeah, cool. just a lab coat. And what I did was I was getting a little frustrated at how long things take to render and, and export. So, mm. well, just to be clear, for those who don't know, there are two... Uh, export is the overall process in what it does when you're exporting a video. Okay. Mm. But within that, you've got two different things that happen. You got one, it renders the footage. Um, and that basically creates separate little video files that kind of all tell mm. together of everything that's happening at that particular in that particular frame, that mm. moment in time. Um, and then you have the encoding, which happens, mm. which turns it into um H two six four, for example. What's that? Which is it's just a code. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> it's a codec which compresses the video file size down to a much smaller file size, with a slight loss in quality generally. But yeah. it's usually so minimal, provided your settings are good. Um, that actually the benefit of the file size drop is yeah. far outweighs um, the that that loss in quality. And it's a bit like the difference between a wave in audio, a WAV yeah. file which is kind of full res for a CD mm. or com- then compressing that down to an MP3. Mm. You know, if you do a highest quality MP3, you can, the file size is, you know, the quality is very, the loss is very small, mm. but the file size is significantly smaller. So that there's a trade off, mm. but that's what, that's what essentially what H264 okay. does. And so I, I did I did a couple of different things. So my my exp- I was encoding at H two six four with some standard kind of settings that I use for bitrate and the profile and all, all of that kind of stuff. And I didn't render. So in Premiere Pro you can render first and then export using those renders, mm-hmm. or you can do it all as, as during the export phase. Okay. So I tried about both. I rendered first and then exported. Mm. Um, I then deleted those render files and on the same clip just went straight to export. So the render happened during that export mm. and I timed it. I did it at H264. I did that at, um, kind of as a, a master file as well as, mm. you know, lossless. I did it in various different um, render file qualities as, as well um, and a whole host of different things. Mm. And what I found is without going into the numbers because I don't actually remember what they are and it doesn't really matter because the yeah. length of the clip and what's happening on it is all relative. Yeah. But what I found was it's actually more efficient and a shorter total time for me to not render in advance, which I have been doing, mm-hmm. to just letting it render during the export. Right. So just for argument's sake, it might take 10 seconds to export when the files have been rendered in advance. Mm. The render might take, if I remember correctly, took about 16 seconds on its own, mm. so, which would leave you with a total of like 26 seconds in uh, in, in total. Okay. Um, but the total, the, the render itself, doing it without rendering in advance, the to- full, full export, sorry, was several seconds shorter mm-hmm. by doing it that way. So what that means is that I don't have to worry about rendering in advance, which can take ages for a, you know an hour hour long podcast, yeah. and then exporting. <clears throat> so now I know that just letting it go all at the end, I'm yeah. going to save myself. You know, it might be five minutes, it yeah. might be tw- 
25 minutes, depending on the length and the complexity of what's going on well, in the in the sequence. One of the differences there, like with Final Cut Pro, for example, is that in Final Cut, what happens is um, it sort of almost always renders um, invisibly in the background. Yeah. And um, yeah. and it, it does that by simply realizing that maybe you haven't touched the key or, or touched the mouse for like a second or longer or whatever you set it to. And it'll automatically start rendering in the background. <clears throat> and uh, please um, welcome uh, this week's guest, Mr. Smokes. Could <laughs> do, you, do you mind? Could you could you get down or are we just going to walk? Yeah, we're getting down. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. And we're Ooh. running away. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can hear that, but that's uh, a cat meowing in the background constantly. <laughs> oh, she stopped. Um, yeah, so it, so essentially what, what happens is <clears throat> as you're working on your project, every time you don't touch a key for longer than, let's say, a second, um, there's some rendering going in the background. And although... You know, that seems like, okay, well, so it renders for a few seconds and then, um, then you carry on working on something and it renders for a few seconds. But but over the course of, let's say, if, you, if you're working on a project all day, then over the course of that day, that adds up to minutes and minutes and minutes of oh, sure. actual render time. And then when you come to the end export, it would have already done all that rendering whilst you were working on the project. And so then the, the final export is so much quicker. And it's always one of the things um, when, you know, people complain about Premiere is they take so long to export, yeah. export at the end. And, um, and that's, you know, it's always sort of uh, held as, as one of the advantages of Final Cut Pro is that it just exports Absolutely. quicker. But of course, all that rendering is already happening in the yeah. background whilst you're yeah. running. So it seems like a clever solution to um, to that. Um I mean, it'd be, you can turn it off, I'm pretty sure, in Final Cut. You, you can, you know, yeah. And it'd be interesting to see the comparison there as to how long it takes. Um, you know, exports on my current MacBook Pro take quite a long time. This is, it's a pretty old machine, um, but I'm about to replace that with uh, with a 2020 iMac version. So I'll be interested to see how much faster that yeah. exports, you know. Hell yeah. The other thing I always find, a, you know, it's, it's a, in in relation to photography is that um, actually the import in Lightroom takes quite a long time, and that's uh, you know when you so there's two different ways that you can import into Lightroom. One is you import it directly from the SD card, so you get the SD card in a card reader, and then in Lightroom you determine where you want to save those files, mm -hmm. and Lightroom basically pulls them off the SD card and saves them. Um, into to the location that you specified and also at the same time that indexes them and then yeah the other previews and the thumbnails whatever are available in Lightroom for you to edit. Um, so that seems like kind of the the easiest version or the easiest way to to import stuff directly from the card. Don't have to worry about anything else. That's cool. The only problem is it takes absolutely forever. <laughs> it takes forever. It's so slow at importing these images. And you know, that's not a problem when you I don't know you're on a day out and you take like a hundred photos or something, not a problem. But if you do, if you shoot an event, you come home with three and a half thousand photos, totally different story yeah, because yeah. it feels like it takes hours <laughs> for these to be, you know, to import those. And the other um, way to do it is basically to just simply um, drag those photos from the SD card and save them onto your hard drive um, into a particular folder. And then once that's happened, you simply import them from that existing folder into Lightroom. So Lightroom doesn't have to do the copying and saving itself. It just simply creates previews and, and thumbnails for for these images and indexes them. And that speeds up the program uh, the, the process. Do you convert your files to DNGs as as you're importing already? No. Because they're in are they uh, what's Nikon? Um the DNGs. Nef. Uh, oh yeah, the NEFs, that's right. Um no, they're just NEFs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's no there's no I don't think there's any conversion going on. It's like okay. You know, um, it just reads those, and then, of course, at the end, once you're done editing them, you then export them as a usually as a JPEG, um, depending on you know what it is that you want to do with them. So I have like a whole host of different export settings for different purposes mm. um, that I use them. Um, you know, for, 
I'll tell you what, this might be quite an interesting thing to go for in a, in a later episode, you know, how you, what are your typical export sort of settings and, and crops perhaps okay, for yeah. photos. And then even as, as boring as this might sound, but is really important is how you go about organizing your many folders and photos that you've, you've got, mm. you know, what file structure it's you going through. So, you, you know, I find that stuff fascinating how some people go about yeah. it. And, you know, I do, I do all of my video projects in exactly the same way every mm. single time. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the, the crop thing is an interesting thing you mentioned. Um, the thing about crops is that it's really important to know where you end up using that photo mm -hmm. or what you're using it for. Um, so for instance, if you're planning on uploading it to social media, like let that be Facebook or Instagram, for example, then you just have to know that um, there's, there's certain crops that work and certain crops that don't work because Instagram, for instance, will just cut off the sides of your photo. Yeah. You know, so with, um, with Instagram, for example, just as an example, if I um, crop it in eight by 10, for example, then I know I'm going to have to full photo showing Instagram. Um, different formats, not so much. So it's, you know, for instance, one of the, I think, things that I see all the time is when people take a photo, um, they will just simply edit the photo and export it and not worry about the crop itself, but leave it in the original aspect ratio. Mm -hmm. um, and that really doesn't work on Facebook or on um, on Instagram, in particular on, on Instagram. So um, so I very often see that, or I, I realize that when I look at other people's photos and I can totally tell that, you know, some of the sides have been yeah. cut off and some things go, okay, we didn't crop it specifically for that purpose. And then of course the, the question is like, okay, so how do you get the most real estate on the screen? So again, uh, w with Instagram, um, if you're shooting a photo in landscape, for example, you're always going to take up less real estate on the screen than if your photo was shot in portrait. Mm -hmm. And so ideally you would want your, your photo to be in portrait so that it takes up most of the screen and it's therefore more recognizable for people. Um, or at least a square crop, right? Yeah. But even, I mean, you know, an eight by 10, um, portrait kind of crop uh, gives you more yeah real estate on screen. absolutely it's bigger yeah? so mm -hmm. um so that's the thing so um and then of course in terms of resolution well it depends on again it depends on what the purpose is you know yeah. um yeah not not many people need a full res export here's a good example let's say in a typical headshot session there's two different two different exports three different exports that can happen <laughs> right one is Let's say you, you have a client uh, gallery. Mm -hmm. So you just want to export the 300 shots or something that you've taken and um, you set up a, an online gallery and the client then uh, looks through that and decides which final shot or shots they want to have retouched. Typical example. Um, and I do that when there's no time in the actual session to do it in the session. I prefer to do it in the session. At the end of the session, it's mm -hmm. usually built mm -hmm. in, but mm -hmm. if for whatever reason it doesn't, can't happen, then, then I use an online um, um, gallery. These shots don't have to be high resolution at all. They can be super low resolution, actually, because all the client needs to be able to see is with well, their face, you know, yeah. and they're going to be relatively small on the screen and they just have to basically go through them and find the ones where they like the expression the most or whatever. So they don't have to be five megabytes, 10 megabytes or whatever per image. They don't. They can be pretty small. Yeah. Um, and then as far as delivery is concerned, I always... You know, I deliver uh, lower res versions for social media use. So if people want to, uh, for instance, if they have a, you know, if we're shooting specifically for LinkedIn, as a LinkedIn profile picture, for example, or if they want images that I can share online or something, you know, again, there's sort of a, there's a limit as to how large these files have to be. Um, and then I deliver like a higher resolution um, version of that file um, in case they want to print the headshots, which these days doesn't really happen that much, especially, I mean, it really never happens with corporate headshots mm -hmm. unless they print them to put them up in like a gallery thing in the office or something. But um, maybe for actors headshots, you know, it doesn't really happen that much these days anymore either. But there's the option there. So they have a slightly higher res um, version for, for printing. And that's it. So, because we're not putting, we're not putting photos on sides of buildings or buses here. No, you know we're creating imagery 
that's usually being viewed on a screen yeah. and it's you know they're usually relatively small in size so we're you know there's no point in creating stuff that's like super super duper high resolution yeah, yeah. it's just not Maybe, you know um so i mean that's, that's what typically happen and of course then you know you build uh, it, the great thing about Lightroom is that you can build these export presets and then you can reuse them. And uh, you can tell Lightroom to label your files in a certain way. And I have all of that preset. So really, you know, if I have a new client or something, I just, you know, I, I pick that preset. I just change the name. Mm-hmm. And then um, Lightroom will automatically not only save the uh, the files in the right folder, as in like actors headshots, but it will also automatically create a subfolder with the client's name. Right. So, you know, it's that process is, is pretty automated at that point. So you don't really have to worry about mm. creating folders. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Yeah. So that's the that's the real advantage. That's that. cool. Yeah. But it'd be interesting to see how that compares on the, on the new machine in terms of export times. It will. It will. I think. Um, I've been. Do you know what the I know there's quite an increase in, in RAM and whatnot. It'll be faster RAM too. Um, what um, what uplift have you got on your processor? No idea. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm so bad with numbers when it comes to that. I have no idea. Um, <clears throat> it'll, be, it'll be faster. Oh, it's faster, yeah. It'll be a lot faster. Yeah. And it'll be i9 as well, probably. Yeah, it's a 10... 10... 10 core? 10 core. 10 core i9. i9. Yeah. yeah. Boost five something boost to five boost at five which means it's probably a 3.6 yeah i think 3. it's a three point something six. like that yeah it's like ballpark, it's anyway. 3.6 yeah boostable to, i have no idea what it means by the way but, but yeah uh, you can yeah i wouldn't worry about the boost it doesn't yeah I'm, I'm not sure i've ever seen it in action i have to say yeah it's got 5k screen i'm looking forward to that nice do you know they're doing a matte screen uh, with a nano tech, yes, Na- yes, I did see that. Look, I did see that, um, and I was briefly considering it. Five hundred quid, all the money for it though. Five hundred pounds more. Yeah. Now, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos, uh, and people were recommending it because apparently it looks really good. It looks yeah. great. It's so the idea there is that um, so Mac have always been doing matte screens, um, and in fact, I have a matte screen on my MacBook Pro. Um, which is really good. It really doesn't glare. It's it's brilliant to use. Mm-hmm. Um, I've loved it, and I didn't see. I haven't seen many other people using the mask screen on that. Um, the only slight disadvantage is that um, it takes away a little bit of the contrast on the matte screen. Not so on the new nano screens. Ah, uh, okay, good. So the difference there is is that it takes away the glare, but it will keep your images look crisp and contrasty. In, in the same way that the regular okay. screen would. That's cool. So that's the sort of new, you know, the novelty about it. Um, and that's, of course, that's really useful if, you, if you're if you positioned in, the, in a place where you're next to a window or where you have a lot of, like, light coming in that, mm. that causes glare. But that's really not the case where I am. You know, I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I'm as far away from any window as I could be, yeah. you know. So I don't have that problem. So, so for me, I was thinking, you know, I can't really justify that 500 pound increase in I price couldn't. just I- for that. If you were willing to spend an extra 500 quid on it, I'd spend it boosting my processor on it if I had to. You know, it's a, an even a better one or whatever yeah, whatever else it might absolutely. be. Uh, if it was like 200 quid, I'd seriously consider it at that point. But Yeah, if it was considerably cheaper, then yes. I mean, this is exactly what I did with um, when I originally bought uh, my current MacBook. Yeah, obviously, I saw that there was, a, there was like a price hike uh, when it came to the, uh, the kind of matte screen. But because I had seen the glariness mm. um, on other people's Macs. I sort of thought, you know what? You know, I'm moving around a lot with this MacBook and I'm in different places all the time. And and actually, I can't really stand the kind of glariness. So I thought at the time, I thought it was a good idea to uh, just spend that extra money. Um, and I think had I, book, uh, had I bought another laptop type of thing this time, then I possibly would have been swayed to go for that same okay. option, if that's even available in the MacBook, I don't know. But let's say it was. Mm. Mm. Um, so in this particular case, I didn't really feel that it was justified, you know. Sure. Um, the other thing that was interesting was that, you know, Apple charged way over the odds for extra RAM. And so everybody, everybody you listen to tells you like, oh, buy the minimum amount of RAM from Apple and then, you know, buy external, yeah. like not external, but buy RAM separately, you know, and save yourself a whole bunch of money. This only applies to iMacs, by the way. 
Remember, in MacBook Pros, you can't change anything. Yes, after. correct. Yeah. And who knows whether it's still going to be the same for the next generation of iMacs that are coming out next year. Apparently next year, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but unfortunately, in my case, my MacBooks developed some issues, so I can't really wait another year. So I'm going yeah. to have to, you know, drop that money now and, um, and be done with it. But uh, super quick, other bit of uh, a photo news that made me think and laugh at the same time. Now, we've been talking about the Canon R5 overheating. I mean, everybody's been talking about that, right? Like, it's been nonstop. Yeah. Um, and initially, you know, there was this whole talk about, oh, how terrible the R5 is overheating. And then, you know, <clears throat> a week or two after, there were about a gazillion videos to that effect on YouTube. Then you had tons of YouTubers coming in with videos saying, uh, oh, uh, it's not that bad, or, you know, it doesn't overheat or whatever, and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so now um, the latest on this is a hack that allows you to, uh, to carry on filming. So here's the deal. So the R5 essentially has a recording limit, okay? And it cuts out after filming, after, after you're filming for 15 minutes. Okay, and so there's a 15 minute um, kind of shutdown point. Now, the, the thing, the argument has always been it's to prevent the, uh, the processor from overheating or the sensor from overheating. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people have tested this. And if you know, they put the camera in the fridge and, uh, and it was always the same. It always cut out after 15 minutes. So it seemed irrespective of what the actual temperature was, the thing always cut out after 15 minutes. So it seemed like it wasn't really related to the actual temperature, but it seemed like it was more like a, a timer hardwired into the, you know, in, into the hardware or software of the, mm -hmm. into the camera itself um, that will basically determine, right, there's a 15 minute recording max and it will just shut down. So I wonder mm -hmm. if after 15 minutes, the sensor will likely overheat. And that they, it, whether it was safer or cheaper for them to hardwire that 15 minute limit in mm. to prevent that damage actually you know, happening. I don't, I, I don't know, just a potential argument uh, for Valid them. thought. However, people have also tested that. So um, Matt Granger, um, mm -hmm. well-known, you know, photography celebrity if you want to call it that on uh, on youtube has actually uh, brought a video testing this this um this particular point so so here's how it works right so essentially um when you open the battery door so what happens is let's say for instance if you're filming something and you and your battery runs out or you open the battery door and you drop the battery out for example then obviously the, cut, the camera shuts down but in canon's case what happens is the file that's currently being filmed is then being saved in the NVRAM, mm -hmm. okay? And that's basically to prevent you from losing any data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nikon works differently. They don't do that for some reason. So basically, if your camera, uh, if your battery drops out whilst you're filming, then that's that yep. particular sequence gone. Um, but anyway, so with Canon, it sets it to, to the DVRAM. Um, and the way that's triggered really is that there's a little... Um, there's a little trigger type of thing when you open the battery door, okay, that basically tells the camera whether the, whether the door is open or not. And essentially at that point, it saves it to the NVRAM. So when you're filming for, let's say, 14 minutes, so you're just under the 15-minute limit, you open the door, you block that sensor, that little trigger thing, with like a, corn, like a little corner rice or something like that. And then you drop the battery out and put it straight back in, so the camera never realizes what's happening, saves that thing to the uh, to the to the NVRAM, or saves the, the, the data to the NVRAM. Um, it will then basically reset the timer to 15 minutes and you can quite happily carry on filming. No. Mm -hmm. And it'll still continue filming at one conti in one continuous file. It'll be two files, but you won't have to wait until the camera cools down. So what, what happens is your recording limit was... Is it not then just simpler to stop recording before 15 minutes and just immediately start again if you can end up with two files anyway oh but you you, you won't have the disruption of having to wait like half no. an hour for the whole thing to cool down 
Oh, wait. Hey, OK. All right. Maybe I misunderstand the time limit then. So it shuts down after 15 minutes currently. And you have to wait how long before you you can use the camera again? I don't know how long, however long it determines. A minute, five minutes, 10 minutes. <clears throat> but there's a time frame. Yeah. OK. But that's only when that time, that 15 minutes reached. Yeah. So if you stop at 14 minutes and start recording again, will it only, will it then only allow you to film for a minute? When you drop the, the battery back no, in? Not doing any of that hack. In normal usage, oh. as it's supposed to be used, you, can you film for 14 minutes, stop recording, and just start recording yes. again and get another 14 minutes? I think, I think that's minutes. how it works now. So while this hack sounds ingenious, actually, mm. if you still end up with two... If you still have to... S- do that all that action prior to that 15 minute li- limit and you still end up with two f- video files out the end of it mm. is it not just easier just to stop record and start again straight away you can't because when you try and start it again it will then not let you record for some time until it determines that the whole thing is cooled down so you then have to wait so basically the idea is i mean it's very similar to what we're doing right now is where we're just pressing stop and then we're pressing start again and then we can record again but on the r5 apparently you know, once you've reached a time limit, the camera then determines, regardless of how hot the sensor actually is, it just determines, right, in order to prevent overheating, you'll have to now wait so long until until you can record again. Does that make sense? Not really. Yes, but not yeah. really. Yeah. <laughs> that's insane. Yeah, so basically, I think the, what, that's, what that means is, is that potentially with a new firmware update, um, Canon can quite easily fix that or extend the time limit or do mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and there's you know, some conspiracy theory out there that basically says, well, maybe they've done this on purpose because everybody talks about the camera, then people talk some more, and then they bring out a fix, you know, which basically sort of, uh, puts the uh, the ownership on the user. And basically, says, you know, at your own risk, you can update this firmware and blah, blah. There's a very very real possibility that could be true. I'm not sure I believe it, but it could easily be true. It's already put me off Canon. (laughs) Well, I don't trust them now. There's stuff like that, if that were true. If that were true. If it's a genuine mistake or just a poor design. It sounds to me like somebody screwed up on this, to be absolutely honest. That's what what we've we've kind of said from the beginning. It Um, just sounds like they've, they've screwed this up. I mean... I'm still interested to see how somebody found this hack, though. I, mean, no, no, I want to get my hands on one of these cameras and actually try this for myself. Yeah, I'm well, not sure I believe half of it. You can uh, you can find the link to the Mac Granger video um, in the description of of this video um, or in the show notes. By the way, so we'll put it there. You can, you yeah. can watch it for yourself. I haven't seen it. I need to go. No. I need to watch that myself. There's apparently. I mean, there's one thing he mentions is that there's a risk. That, Apparently, there could be a risk that your files might be uh, corrupted afterwards. Amazing. Not that he's... I think in his experience, it hasn't happened, but it is somehow he mentioned it. Um, I haven't actually got my hands on an R5. No. I also haven't really been able to... No, I've not seen one at all. ...to find, to find out. Um, what I have heard, though, is that you know, in terms of image quality, it's supposed to be stunning. And I've seen clips. Name, so it does look good. You know, it does look good. So, um, but the rest of it does not work for me. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so that was a interesting, you know, the continuation of the overheating saga. Mm. Well, it will conclude one day. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, with the R, R5-2. Five, five Mark II, Mark no two doubt. Yeah, yeah. 5.1. Yeah, whatever they're going to call that from now on. Mm. R5 Mark II, possibly. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I'll be looking forward to some new announcements. Um, I think... I heard Nikon are coming out with some um, improvements of the uh, the Z6 and the Z7. Really? Serious? Yeah, apparently so. Um, no massive redesigns, uh, but I've heard that there could very well be um, a second yeah. card slot. Oh, that's cool. Included somewhere yeah, so. that's cool. Panasonic have got a um, full frame camera coming out as well. I heard about that. Um, not very much to know about it just yet. It's going to be entry level full frame by the oh, sounds really? of it. Mm, okay. Um, uh, 24 megapixel uh, sensor, I believe, um, and seven frames per second. I, that's about mm. all I can I okay. know about it. It's like Z5 territory, basically. Sounds like it. Mm. Sounds okay. like it. Um, uh, do you know what? I don't even know if it's mirrorless. I'm going to guess it is, 
but I don't know. It would really, I mean, it seems really, silly to come out of anything else right now. Yeah, it would surprise me. I mean, this is why now I can really surprise me with the D seven eighty. Like, what's? I don't really get the point in that. Yeah, to be one hundred percent fair, uh, and I'm saying this despite the fact that I have had some friends who've looked at this camera very closely and have actually said they really like it. I just don't see the point. Mm. No. You know, it's like a halfway house. Yeah. Between now and the future. Yeah. You know, like a hybrid car. Yeah. It's halfway between petrol and electric. God, I hope Gary watches this. 100%. (laughs) (laughs) And on that bombshell. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So next week, we're going to be... well, no, we're not going to be announcing the winner of the uh, the landscape competition. In fact, um, you be will be announcing the winner on social media. Correct. Um, and uh, quite possibly, if you're listening to this after Thursday, then uh, then the winner of the landscape competition may very well have been announced already. So uh, go over to our Facebook page. That's um, www.facebook.com forward slash camera shake podcast, where you can find all the related links to these uh, to this uh, show and um, and of course um, images. And video links and everything else that goes with it. Did you just do the WWW as well? You did, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Okay. WWW. Just checking. I've yeah. not heard anyone do that for many years. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, this dates us. Worldwide Web well, dot Facebook dot com. Yes. Um, so, yeah, find us on the interweb. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Facebook.com forward slash camera shake podcast. Um, and uh, alternatively, you know, drop us a line, you know, send us some comments there. Um, we're always happy to hear from people. Absolutely. That would be awesome. Um, yeah, that's, that's really all we've got Absolutely. for this week. We have. Fantastic. Cool. See you next time when it's time again. There used to be this thing on the Muppet Show. Do you remember Pigs in Space? Oh, vaguely. <laughs> God. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a long time ago. Yeah. Join us next time when you hear Dr. Bob say, Oh, no. Oh. I killed him again. Or something like that. Uh, I don't know. Very anyway. few people are going to get that reference. Really? Oh, my God. <laughs> Right, so next time you're gonna uh, you can join Nick and me dressed as um, <laughs> Kermit and Miss Piggy. There you go. <laughs> See you next week. Bye.